So I design house plans. I've told you guys that I'm using some of the stuff I'm, I'm teaching you. And what we're going to talk about today is something that engineers call moment. And it is actually rather a huge concept. Um, in, in this sense, and again, this, this table will serve as a decent illustration. Um, does it make sense in terms of static? The table might weigh 50 pounds, and therefore it's there going down into the ground. And in order for that fit thing to stay static, the, the, the ground has to be strong enough to push back. Of course, if that was mud, then that thing would be sinking into the mud because it would not be able to do the job of lifting it, so to speak. Um, but there's a second thing that this beam, notice it's actually being supported on two ends, and that's basically what's happening every time there's a hole in a wall. That glass right there is not holding up the roof. The roof weighs a lot, and it is not pushing on that glass. Well, how is it not pushing on the glass? Well, that's because there's a beam up above the top of that that's actually carrying that weight, and it's transferring it over to the posts. Well, that's what's happening here. You have all this weight pushing down right here, and this beam is strong enough to carry that weight all the way out to the side and get it to the posts that are supporting it down below. But as a consequence, does it make sense that beam wants to go kind of like, wants to bend down in the second, down in the middle and break? And basically, the desire it has to rotate, that's called moment. Now, you would have discussed this already in physics under the name torque, but torque and moment are basically the same thing. There actually is a subtle distinction, and I've read it twice and I still don't. Like I don't know it, therefore it's kind of an irrelevant distinction. Um, and so when I go into, let's see, I do this at home, so I'm hoping I can do it here. I go into a program that actually does all of this engineering that we're learning in this class automatically. Uh, software, BC Calc. Try for free, download concept, PC. In my case, I'm not trying it for free. I'm just logging in because I use it all the time. Oh, there we go. Uh-oh, here we go again. What's my password? I have no idea. Try that. Try that. Bam. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna make a new beam. So roof beam, this is what I'm doing like almost every night. So I've got this beam here and notice you have a picture of it. Let's see. It's 14 feet long and and I haven't selected what beam yet, but it's 14 feet long. And obviously there's a bunch of weight up on the top of it. And so let's see, I'm gonna put a load on it. And I, I, won't, I won't bother to choose it. I'm just gonna do it really fast. Oops, now I gotta fix it. So I just put a load of 700 pounds. Notice it says dead and snow. I'm not dead in live load, but they're actually naming the live load snow because that is the live load on a, on a roof. That's, that is the live load on a house. Um, so there's 200 pounds of dead load, which might be you know the chairs and stuff, that the things that are always in there, which might be like the floor, which is never going to move. But then it's also got 500 pounds of snow on it. So that beam's got 700 pounds. And notice I put it, at a location and I put it five feet in. So it's actually not in the middle. And so that's kind of the equivalent of saying, hey, look, here's this table. But let's not put the load right in the center of it, which if I put it in the center at 700 pounds, does that make sense that'd be 350 there and 350 there? But if I go like this, does it make sense this one's gonna have to carry more of it? So now this might be like 400 and that's 300 or something like that. 
And if I actually got right over the post, this post would be 700 and then it'd be done. So because I'm pushing on it here, does it make sense that doesn't want to go crack? That's moment. So, all right, I've put a load on it and now I'm going to go over to the product. And notice I'm actually not doing any engineering. I'm like clicking buttons like an idiot. And so let's put a, let's put a Versa lamb. And let's put a little small guy on there, like three and a half by three and a half versa lamb. So that's literally, it's three and a half inches wide, three and a half inches tall. It's pretty small and it spans 14 feet and it has 700 pounds on it. Of course, the question is, is that, is that okay? And I'm, I don't know, I don't know spec beams this small, so I actually don't have a, a feel for it. Notice it turned red. <laughs> so a lot of times in real engineering, even if we know what we're talking about, you can't really afford to have people making calculations. It's time consuming and we make mistakes, right? So the first time I ever had to, on, in a house, you spec out a beam and I turned in my plans into the city and they said, we need beam calculations. And, you know, for me, that was like, oh, okay, I don't even know what you're talking about. Cause I looked it up in a chart and they wanted to see all these calculations, the calculations we're learning to make right now. And, and so I made them, like I figured out how to do them because of like understanding this class and I turn them in and they're like, well, that's not what we want because we can't understand that. We don't, we're not engineers. We just want, well, we want this. We want this that says not red, <laughs> red, bad, black, not bad. Notice it says right here that that's 262%. It's like double and there's, that's way too much weight. This is not going to work. It says it's not going to work. And so I just click bigger and bigger beams until they all turn black. And I love this. Like, even though I love this class, I love math. I think it's totally cool. But that's, I, I'm not going to screw up. I'm not going to get sued because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm drawing, like I'm drawing 10 house plans right now simultaneously. So I'm doing a lot of these and I'm going to make mistakes. And this makes it sure that I won't. And so notice all those percentages now, this is like the percentage as to how hard it's working. They're all less than 100, so that's good to go. So in my case, I go up here, click this button, which actually makes a printable page, and I turn that in. And there's my bean count and all that. And, and that's a really hard portion of what this class is. And that's what's so cool about the generation we live in, because this stuff is kind of hard, and someone's made software that does it automatically, which saves a bunch of time. And it also means that not you don't actually have to have all of the training you know, to, to be able to do some of this stuff. But I want you to notice um, a couple of things here. One of them is these two, B1 and B2, those are the bearing points. Notice it actually says hmm, bearing one over here, so over here, bearing one over here, it says has 164 dead, 324 snow. What is that? A total of 488. So it has 488 pounds, which makes sense because this is closer to that side. But then the other one has 105 and 76. What is that? 280 roughly. This one has less. Does that feel kind of right? Now, in my case, that's really important to me because remember that weight is going down and I've now concentrated the weight that used to be up there. And I got to make sure like that's not going to push into the dirt. So it turns out the dirt pushes back at a certain amount. And if it's not, if it's more than um, 1500 pounds a square foot, I actually have to put a concrete footing underneath the house so that that doesn't actually sink down. So these are, well, these are statics calculations that I'm basically making side money to, to make here. And I, I want to show you that today. In other words, how did that, how did that 700 pounds, how did we know how much got on this one and how much got on that one? Because you got to know that. That's essential for these calculations. Um, the second thing you might notice here, though, is of that weight, that 700 pounds right there, notice right above it here, it says self-weight. In other words, doesn't the beam weigh something too? In, in, a real, in the real world, you have you know, a car driving on a bridge, but remember the bridge itself is actually most of the weight. The car is like a fly. So in this case, 700 pounds is a lot of the weight, but notice that says this particular one has a self weight of just, what is that, five pounds? Notice it's all dead weight because it's not going anywhere, right? I think that's five, it says right here, 
pounds per foot. So this, this particular beam weighs five pounds a foot. So if it's 14 feet long, that's another 70 pounds. So notice that got included. I never did, I never put that in there, but it did it automatically. So actually this is 770 pounds. And notice, and we're gonna to get to this later in this class, we have this one point load here, but notice we have arrow, 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 because that's five pounds every single foot all the way along that thing. That's a continuous load. And so that's what this beam actually has to support. But notice this word right here, positive moment. See how it says there's 2,267 foot pounds of moment here? That's the beam's desire under this load to go and crack and rotate. That's how badly it wants to do this. Now you might think well, that's a really huge number, 2,200. Um, and so that's what we got to talk about today. Torque is a force times a distance. It's, it's not only how much weight is it, but how far is it away? Because you may know that if I hold up something heavy like this clock, it's actually a lot easier to hold when it's closer to you. If you reach out, it's actually harder. That's more torque. Ah, it wants to rotate down now. So it's not just the 700 pounds. It's the 700 pounds times how far it is away. And that's why that number grew so much. And so that's really the second thing. There's two things. When something wants to move, it wants to go down. But it also might want to rotate. And so rotation is something we also have to stop. To make something static, we got to make it not you know, fall through the ground. We also got to make it not rotate. And beams are something that, well, constantly want to rotate. So remember that 2267 number, and notice it says that's only 46% of what's allowable. In other words, that beam will do twice that. That beam's no problem. No problem at all. Notice the one that's the worst. What's the one that's most, that's closest to failing here? Look at those percentages. 69%. Do you see that's the one that, no, I'm wrong. Yeah, that's only 11%. So it could do 10 times that, no problem. So it's total deflection. And it turns out a beam on a house can only deflect down one inch. If it's more than that, it bounces and it also breaks things. Like that glass would break if the beam bent down. And also just feels weird if you walk across the house and it's kind of going stuck in the swing. And so the fortunate thing for me is if this fails, it's just going to bend too much. Like I'm not going to kill people. Failure is not the bridge fell. It's it bent too much. And so there's like factors of safety built in. But notice there's deflection and there's positive moment. So, and again, I'm just trying to build a, a sense of a sense of understanding in you of the bigger picture here. This is taking up this, this will take a little extra time, but I'm showing you things that aren't in the book. Things that are real, things that'll get you jobs because you actually know what the heck you're talking about. Now I didn't have to do this, but this is this is a chart that is that is what people would look at. And this chart is. This chart is kind of where it tells you about each beam. So for instance, notice, let's see, um, let's choose a beam that is one and a half inches wide. And let's say 11 and a quarter inches tall. Are you picturing that okay? It's like, it's kind of tall and skinny like that. Notice what it tells me. It tells me right here, it weighs 4.3 pounds a foot. That was something that showed up on the chart a minute ago except this is a different size. And notice it says allowable shear. We'll be talking about that in that, this class, but that's a desire for a beam just to go slice in half like that, which is what it does when it's on the edge of a post. So that's how much shear that can withstand, it can stand 3,200 pounds there. But notice allowable moment. Basically, if you put more than 6,374 pounds of moment on that beam, they're basically saying, we can't guarantee it isn't gonna rotate. It's going to break in the middle and rotate. Well, it's actually going to break under where that point load is. 
that's it, it'll resist it if you go above that it might not resist it because it wants to tear apart can you see the bottom fibers pulling apart can you see the top fibers smashing and it, it won't be able to resist that internally so let's see i think our beam was like five and a half by five and a half wasn't it so isn't it this one notice it can handle i can't see the top of the chart but 6800 pounds of moment and ours is only like 2200 so hey cool we're good all right so the thing is we got to understand what this moment thing is like how badly does something desire to rotate and that's what we got to talk about now so let me show you something cool to start with <laughs> nah, i'm just going to do this for real That's a common way of showing a support for something. That's kind of, that's a beam being supported by a, a point. And so, well, let's do our, let's do our example. We said this was 14 feet. And we'll keep it a little simpler. And I won't have a beam weight. I'll just leave that off for now. But we put 700 pounds right there, and that was five feet in. And so, does it make sense that these two supports here are going to have to work together to lift 700 pounds? They've got to be able to push back. But again, because that force is closer to the left one, I'll call this bearing one and bearing two to match what we did before. We can see that bearing one is going to have to work a little harder. And so, how much desire does this have to rotate, let's say, in this direction, around this point? So, the moment around bearing one. I want to see how badly that wants to desire to rotate around that. Well, since torque. or moment, we'll be using moment in this class mostly, is equal to a force times a distance. So that's something I already know from physics. Um, does it make sense that that 700 pounds, doing this in our system, 700 pounds, that's its force, times its distance. Now, what point was I rotating it around? Around B1, so that distance of five feet. Notice the units for that. We get 3,500, 3, but then it's foot pounds or pound feet. Well, isn't that what we saw a second ago on that chart? And see how it got so much bigger? It was like, you know, it's only a force of 700, but in terms of desire to rotate, way higher. So you get foot pounds or pound feet for units, which is kind of a weird unit. But, and again, we can't let that happen, right? We, we cannot let that happen. We can't let stuff rotate, not good. What's, there, what, what can fix it? Well, this force right here, I'll call that the force at bearing two. If that wasn't there, then it is gonna rotate. Does that make sense? But it is there and it's pushing up. Well, how badly is it going to have to push up? Well, notice its force is, Its force is, well, we don't know. But we do know its distance is 14 feet. Does that make sense? That's how far it away it is from the point around which we're considering this to be rotating. And so would you agree that this also has to be up to the challenge? In other words, it has to be up for the challenge. You give us the same exact answer. And so that's how I'm going to figure out force of V2. What's your calculator say that is if you solve that simple equation there, which is 3,500 divided by 14. I just made this up, so I actually don't know. So yell it out. 250? That's cool. Now in this picture, if this is 250 and together, these have to do 
700 pounds of work, then does it make sense I automatically, what am I doing? Does it make sense I automatically know over here that 250 plus 450 is 700 and so that's the delineation. That's how you figure out which one did more work. So sure enough, the force at B1 had to do more work, almost twice as much work. And so this is the this is the delineation. And so that's why it's so important then because in my case, I think, okay, I have 460 pounds pushing down over here. Remember, I, that we're not just done like, oh, there's a post there. Well, that post might at some point is sitting in the dirt, right? And then I gotta make sure that that isn't gonna sink into the ground. So the concept of torque or moment of being force times distance is really simple and extremely important part of this. However, there's something that's really important to note here, and that's something I'm about to screw up and challenge. And that is these must be, have you seen that symbol before? Perp. These have to be perpendicular or this does not work. And they are not always perpendicular. Now, in our case, were those perpendicular? Yeah, because this force was perpendicular to that distance. Like we kind of didn't have to think about it here. And probably when you're in physics, that's all you ever did. And so you maybe never even noticed this, but now we're gonna start to have forces coming in at weird angles and it's gonna kind of screw this all up. So that's the background of kind of how torque or moment works, desire for something to rotate. Um, incidentally, just for the fun of it here, watch this, it's kind of interesting. What if I did the rotation around B2? Would I get the same exact answer? In other words, this time I'd have 700, but it'd be multiplied by, well, the distance over here would actually be nine feet, wouldn't it? So it'd be 700 times nine, which is 6,300. But then we'd have, force at bearing one times its distance of 14, that would need to be 6,300 as well, right? 6,300 divided by 14. Hey, look at that, 450. Notice I didn't have to make the calculation because there's two things I'm trying to fix. One of them is 700 going down, there better be the ability to push 700 back up. That's what kept it static. But the moment has to work and notice it worked it's kind of like everything agrees here. No matter which way that I do this, I get 450 and 250 for kind of the force that's on those two supports. Okay. So I love mountain biking and I've been in this position many times. Um, but notice this dude was riding along and it was having a great day, went over this jump. And then he suddenly began to rotate. So what I want you to think about from a physics perspective is why did he want to rotate? So this is something that happens in mountain bikes all the time. Like when you jump through the air between me and my bike, I'm a center of mass. I weigh 180, my bike weighs 30. So it's like 210. There's a 210 pound dot flying through the air. And it's at the center of mass between me and my bike. Now, no matter what you do when you go off a jump, that dot is going to fly through the air in the shape of a parabola. And, and wherever that lands, hopefully that lands in a good place. But does it make sense while the dot is flying through the air, the dude could be rotating? So if I go off the jump and I'm leaning too far forward, maybe you're a skier or a snowboarder, you could actually be flying through the air. And although you live and landed in the right location, you did a 180, you landed on your head or you went backwards or something. Well, notice this person didn't jump quite far enough. And I don't know if you can picture this, but there, this is a double and there's kind of a dip right here. So the dude was trying to jump over this gap and land over here on this down, which is a nice place to land. It's where you're happy when you're over there. 
but notice his tire, you can see the dirt flying up right here. His tire hit right there. So his front tire stopped. And all of a sudden now he has this point around which he's rotating. Well, remember he weighs 210 pounds or whatever, and he has a center of mass. So you have this 210 pound force right here. And now it's suddenly a distance away from a point around which he's rotating. You got a lot of torque there. So his face, as you can see, is one foot from being full of dirt. I wish I had this on video. So here's somebody who is less, who is more successful. An exciting moment for Amy, a little play on words. So she lands on, let's say, the flat ground. So I just took a picture of her flying through the air. And so let's say she lands right there. So she, she was kind of rotating backwards a little bit. Does that make sense? And that kind of would happen if you went off a jump, you might fly through the air. And so she's flying through the air with you know, her wheels staying like this, if she's lucky. Hopefully she's not continuing to go backwards. But you could fly through the air and just kind of land like this. But what's going to happen when her back wheel hits the ground? Yeah, she's going to go like this. She's going to, it's going to incite a moment, a, a rotation. Suddenly she's going to be rotating. And this is one of the things that makes you crash. The bike goes slap like this, and then the back comes up, and then you go over the handlebars and land on your face. But see, the problem here is, do you understand that this is her force right there? Like if she's flying through the air right there, that's her, we'll say two, well, we'll, we'll give her a, a few less pounds. Let's make her 170 pounds between her bike and her. And that's the direction that it's traveling. Do you understand the logic of that? Because as she's flying through the air, and it's really that dot, her center of mass right there, that dot has a force. Notice it's got a force and a magnitude. It's not just 170 pounds. It's like, which direction is it going? That's why vectors are so cool. So the arrow shows what direction it's going. Um, how's red showing up up there? Can you see red? A better color. I don't know. Let's give this an angle, just keep it simple at 20 degrees. And so now we have a, a full vector. We know what direction she's flying and we know how, with how much force. But see, the problem is because of that sort of drawing that I made, basically now this whole system is gonna kind of rotate. So as soon as she hits the ground, but do you see the problem here is like, this distance right here, that distance is not perpendicular to that right there. So we can't just we can't just measure this distance and multiply it by 170 and we have the answer. You see the problem with that? And you have some sterile problems in your book that do this, but you know, this is just a little, I think you can visualize this a little bit better. So hmm. Let's. Let's put some numbers to this and see if we can actually figure out how much desire she has to moment or rotate. How, what's, what's her torque? So I gotta, I gotta have some, we have some measurements. I'd have to take them. I'm just gonna fake them and make them up in the interest of time. But let's say, let's say this distance right here, uh, just to keep it simple is two feet and this is three feet. That one looks a hair longer. They don't look exactly the same. Um, but I don't want to have decimals. I want to keep it simple. So, so her center of mass, and notice that's perpendicular. And then let's say that this, this angle of the ground that she's about to land on right here, that looks a little bigger than what I called 20. So let's call this 25. And let's say that, can you see this okay? No, that's not good. Let's say that this distance right here is four feet. Again, I'm just trying to keep it simple. But actually, we have all the measurements now that kind of des describe what's going on here. And notice it's interesting that kind of the bike, the bike and the person are irrelevant. And chapter one talked about this, but it's it she gets reduced to a dot. She's a, and your book calls it a particle. She's a 170 pound particle flying through the air. But because of the rigidity of the system in which this is made because you can appreciate the bike could just crack in half when this happens. But assuming that whole system is rigid, herself included, she's just gonna land and then boom to the ground and hopefully not crash. But again, my point is, do you see how much more complicated it is here? Because the, because the force 
is not, I'll write it this way, the force is not perpendicular to the distance. So let's make our own little diagram of this. And, and also let's kind of clean this up a little bit. Watch this. There's no reason I have to leave that thing kind of up in the air. So those two points right there represent the two points where the bike is gonna kind of hit the ground. And I'll draw this a little more accurately in the sense that this is two feet, this is four feet, this is three feet. And then we've got this force coming in. So I can't just go 170 times four. You see the problem there? Now, all I've drawn is kind of the, the salient points, but Maybe I'll draw this in in like a different color, but it's like you need to kind of think of this as, as kind of like a solid triangle. Does that make sense? Like that triangle is desiring to rotate. That's really what's happening there. More interestingly, it's a human on a bicycle, but it's really that triangle that's desiring to, that 170 pound triangle that's desiring to rotate. So we kind of simplified this almost like kind of like it's just falling straight down as opposed to a bicycle landing. Wouldn't there be a force? going to the left or going to the negative direction. Well, that's the idea because of the 170 pounds, the force is going down and to the left. And so it's kind of split, like how much is it going left? How much is it going down? Now I won't belabor this point a ton, but do you notice the 20 and the 25 degrees don't go anywhere in this picture? Because I sort of took the, I took the ground and rotated it. So let me quickly do the geometry it would take to fix that. Do you understand that if this is 25, this is also 25? Oh, yeah, yeah. Since this is parallel to this. And so basically from that flat ground, this got rotated up 25 and then this got rotated up 20 more. So it's actually 45 degrees. Up here, let's see. Yeah, from the ground, that angle is 45. So in this case, I was able to add those two angles together. Green's not a good color, is it? So basically, that's the angle that this is coming in. All of a sudden, I don't like, yeah, I don't like that. Let's do something different. Let's make this 35. I don't want it to be 45 because then both, both of them are exactly the same. So that makes this 55 now, you cool with that? So the problem is we're trying to rotate around this point. That says rotation. But the problem is, is this vector right here, like if we're to take 170 times a distance, does it make sense to you that this would have to be the distance right about here? Because that's perpendicular. Like this would have to be D in order for us to take 170 times D. It's gotta be perpendicular. Notice that's at a really weird location. Like I don't even know where that is. I don't even know what, I don't even know what triangles to set up to even figure out what that would be. Now, is it possible to do that? Yeah, it absolutely is. But here's a way easier method. Since the force is not perpendicular, four, four is certainly, not perpendicular to 170. I mean, that's like the only, that's like the only dis distance I kind of know. Does that make sense? And if we were lucky, then this, you know, this would be, this length right here would be perpendicular if we were lucky, because then we could do four and three and do the Pythagorean theorem. And we would know that, but can you see that that, although it looks pretty close, it's not, that would be very surprising if that actually happened to be the case. 
So here's a way easier way. Split this 170, and this is what we've been doing in the last section. Split this 170 into its two components, its vertical component Actually, I need to draw that over here. It's vertical component. And it's horizontal component. Would you agree if we split that 170 into those two, does it make sense we know exactly what those distances are now? You see how much easier that is? So when it's in an angle like this, you've actually got to split it into parts. Now, because this vector over here can move, in other words, I could move it over to here. Does it make sense that this is the right triangle we're talking about? This would be the force in Y and this would be the force in X. And that's the 170, isn't that what we've been doing lately? And so if this is 55 degrees, can't I say that the force in X is 170 times the cosine of 55? And the force in Y is 170 times the sine of 55. You're, you're feeling that? And I'm obviously just making this up as I go, so that's why I don't already know the answers. 170 cosine 55, that gave me 97.5. Again, this is my way of saying that's an important number. It's not the answer, but it's an important number. And the other one is 139.3. I should stick pounds in there, I suppose. So these aren't foot pounds. Yeah, they're not foot pounds. So we basically took our 170, which is at an angle, and we basically said, she now has 97 pounds of desire to go to the earth and then 139 pounds of desire to fly through the air. That's the breakdown. So her moment then, I want you to watch carefully because this leads into something we're gonna talk about on Thursday. Her moment, desire to rotate. is her, and I'm going to rewrite this right here as her force in X, and this is her force in Y. Would be equal to her force in X. And I'm going to purposely write this a little bit, kind of waste a little bit of time. So it's force in X. How far is her force in X away from this point right here, perpendicularly? Notice perpendicular to that would be there, wouldn't it? Isn't that perpendicular? So isn't it four feet? Notice that four feet, though, is, is kind of like a distance. Well, isn't it Y? It's like a Y distance. So force of X, which we said was 97.5. I won't be lazy. I'll write pounds in there. And then her distance in Y is four feet. And so is that the answer? Why not, Joseph? You're right. Exactly. And by the way, which which way is that wanting her to rotate around that point, clockwise or counterclockwise? wants to go this way, which is counterclockwise in English. Is that a positive or a negative in the language of mathematics? That's counterclockwise. That's actually positive. That way is positive. So we got to pay attention to this, because actually one of these forces could tr be trying to get her to rotate counterclockwise. The other one could be trying to stop that, in which case we need to subtract them. Is there anything about the unit circle in terms of positive and negative? Uh-huh. That's right. So like on a unit circle, didn't we say that direction is positive and that direction is negative? So that's why it'd be positive here. So this one's positive. And as Joseph pointed out, notice then we have the force of Y multiplied by what distance? Notice the force of Y, where is it perpendicular? 
Notice it's not like the forces up there. Remember, vectors are like wind. They can be moved anywhere. Now, you can't spin them, but you can move them any place. So I'm sort of thinking of that force of y as though it were down here, because it's right there that it's actually perpendicular. Does that make sense? And notice, what's that distance? Well, that's actually a distance in x. So my force of y, which was 139.3, my distance of x, which is actually three feet. Is that trying to rotate it the same direction? Yeah, they're both working together for that, for that reason. <clears throat> I don't have any negatives here. I just get to add those. So whatever that is, 97.5 times four plus 139.3. <clears throat> times three, I got roughly 800. I'm going to go ahead and write this out 807.9. Again, your book, if this was the case, would say 808, wouldn't it? It'd be rounding it to three numbers. And that would be pound feet or feet pounds. That's how badly she wants to rotate. Now, Again, is this just nerds sitting at the side writing, doing math equations while the other people are having fun riding their bikes? No, like this is, I mean, I don't sit on the side of the trail making these kind of calculations, but basically that, that's going to tell me whether she's going to like be able to withstand that. Does it make sense? And she comes down on the handlebars with that much desire to rotate, bam, right here. It could be that like, oh, my muscles can't hold out. And so now my face is in the handlebars and my teeth are rolled out. Or it could be like, Bam, and I fly over the handlebars. And so it's like telling me, you sort of, it allows me to pre calculate kind of what's going to happen here, right? Is she going to crash? Is she not going to crash? And you can appreciate as an engineer, that's what we have to do. Like we have to predict stuff. We, if the car drives over a bridge and it wants to rotate downwards, we have to be able to calculate what's going to happen. And the answer is nothing, right? <laughs> nothing is going to happen. That's your job, make everything static. So it's kind of a playful example in a sense, but I think you can see that. What's that? I said, Amy's definitely going to eat it though, right? Yeah, it's probably going to be face into. Yeah. I noticed that's such a big number, right? Like 139 pounds isn't that much, but the distance makes a big difference. And that creates that pop. And, you know, it's like she's going to have to sort of be able to like bench press 800 pounds there for a split second. Yeah. Now it is going to like come to a stop. And so the question is, she's certainly not just going to sit there and not even move, but she's going to go, you know, like, Arr. hopefully she can actually bring it to a stop before bad things happen. I wonder what, like, because they probably do this, we talked in the past, like, for a professional BMX or, like, stunt devil, if you're going to, like, do a stunt, they try to, like, work out the math, hopefully, or they just go on a random jump. Yeah, and that's kind of the point of this, because I, I do like to jump. Like, I people my age don't jump, and I'm always, I want to jump, but I also don't want to crash, because I'm old enough that I'm, it's going to take me longer to heal, and it's not just, like, I don't just cast myself off jumps, but but I'd like to kind of land where I'm supposed to land. That's kind of the key. Some of it's practice, but some of it you can actually do the math. If you look down at your speedometer and you're going the right speed, your center of mass, you know, the angle of the jump, your center of mass is going to fly to this location. If that location is the downhill side of the next jump, then your, your connection to the ground is going to be nice and smooth. But if you land on the uphill side, you're just going to come to a stop and all of your body is just going to smash into your bike. And that's when you get hurt. So in your experience, like what's an acceptable like moment to come down I don't know, because um, I haven't calped that. I wonder, yeah. if, if you did the calculations and showed me 800 pounds, I'd be like, no, I'm not going to jump that. Right. Maybe 200 pounds. Like, yeah. Like, like, okay, like, that sounds doable. And that's exactly what I'm saying. It's like, it's kind of neat to think that you could actually pre-calculate this stuff. And yeah. you've probably seen some stuff in the X Games, and there is a mountain bike uh, competition every year that they do in Utah, Red Bull, Rampage. Go Google, go Google and search that. It is insane. They're doing backflips on their bikes off of like a 70 foot drop. I mean, it's just, if you get that wrong, you're, you got a lot more than 800 pounds, you know, to worry about. It's there's, there's massive. Like, see viral videos. This one dude like jumped off of five trampolines stacked on each other on the ground. He's like built different. And then he's like, let's see if you actually are built different. And you're like, cow, like, how tall it would all be, how much force he'd be coming down with based on like how much he like weighed. And then it turned out like that guy didn't do anything impressive. He's like, no, like you're built normal. Like that's that's exactly what you should be. Like the force that you put <laughs> on your knees there 
He's like, you're probably going to be blown out of 50, but you're built pretty normal. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that weird? I mean, it's actually cool that you can calculate this stuff. That's kind of what it comes down to if you, you know, have the time and instruments. Well, of course, you know, what is your book question going to look like? Well, a couple of dorks pulling on a pole with a couple of ropes. I mean, and so, you know, it can make this class look irrelevant. Um, but you can appreciate there are guy wires like this that you could even see if you looked out the window that are holding telephone poles up. And, you know, it's not that some person is standing there holding it. Um, but notice this picture is, is quite a bit simpler. So anyway, let's just wade into it. You have this in front of you. Notice again, this is one that's got an asterisk by it. So I picked that because it's not the answer is not in the book. I can't assign this one to you. The man at B exerts a force of 30 pounds. Man, you got to lift some weights, bro. 30 pounds. And so I'm just going to use this figure. So he's kind of pulling it at 30 right there. And that's in the direction. And notice it's 45 degrees. And so, okay, cool. And then trim the magnitude of the force F. Okay, so they don't tell me this guy. And notice they, over here, they gave me an angle. What angle? They told me the, this guy's pulling at 45 degrees, but over here, they gave me the coordinate direction angles, which is actually, when you get used to it, easier. That will always be on axis, having an X, Y, or Z. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it won't be at some weird angle. There's always going to be horizontal, vertical, and then the, the diagonal. So this one is F. Like, they don't, they don't tell me what that is. If they had told us that was like 50 pounds, then we could have figured out like, you know, what direction is the pole going to go? Is it, are they perfectly balanced and the pole's just going to sit there? Or is one of them actually pulling harder and it's actually going to get tipped over? But instead, what they said is, let's make it balance, I think. So they said, prevent the pole from rotating. In other words, zero moment. Notice they said the resultant moment about A. Does it make sense? That's the natural. That's the natural place it would be. In other words, you sort of assume the poles attached to the ground in some way. So that makes sense it'd be rotating around A. Now, again, as I said before, I'm going to erase this, but in order to find the desire it has to rotate, do I take 30 times 18? No, because they're not perpendicular. That's the tricky thing about this. So where would the distance I'm after be? It would have to be right there. Isn't that, doesn't that look like about 90? Does that strike you as possible to calculate in that picture? I might be able to. Um, however, you know, where's the 45? You got to be a little careful because the 45 is not necessarily in that figure. The point is, this is way easier rather, rather than trying to figure out that distance so I can say 30 times that distance, it'd be way easier if I broke this into the force in X and the force in Y. Because I will know those distances way easier. And by the way, this is a, a pattern that we, I'll go back to that in a second, but did you notice, just to kind of highlight this, because there's a mnemonic device, a memory device on your note sheet that looks terrifying called a cross product. And the cross product is based on the fact that, hey, look, this was a, this was a force in X, but we ended up multiplying by a distance in Y. The force in one direction was like a distance, went with the distance in the other direction. And then over here, it was the same thing. It was the force in Y, but then it was the distance actually X. It was like a vertical force, a horizontal distance. Like in order to be perpendicular, they end up kind of, it's not like force in Y and distance in Y. Does that make sense? And so that's just a pattern we're going to see with this question too. Do you see that that's happening? So I've got that force in X up there. Well, I got to calculate it. Um, but again, notice because this angle is 45 degrees, then if I drew a right triangle right here, then this is 45, then wouldn't this one up here also be 45 because 45 and 45 and 90 is 180. 
So it's not that this angle equals this angle, it's this angle plus this angle has to be 90 and it just happens that they're both 45. Again, that's a terrible problem. They should not have made that 45 because it's just one more thing that might confuse me in a later problem. And then because this angle is 90, then this one would also be 45. And so then couldn't I say that this right here would be 30 times the cosine of 45? My machine says that's 21.2. So notice it's not 30 times 12, but it is 21.2 times, I'm sorry, 18. It isn't 30 times 18, but it is 21.2 times 18. Do you agree with that? Isn't that now perpendicular to the distance of 18? Notice it's a force of X and yet a vertical distance, a distance in Y. Now, interestingly, what do you notice about the force in Y here, though? Notice where it's pointing. It's pointing straight at A. So, although the force in Y would also be 21.2, what's its distance? Since this is really where I'm thinking of the force of Y being, Notice actually a distance of zero. It's pointing right at A. In other words, it's not desiring it to rotate at all. If I push on this podium from this direction, does it want to rotate? Yeah, it does. If I push on it straight above that, straight down on it, it doesn't want to rotate. If I push it any other angle, it doesn't want to rotate. But if I push right on it, it's, there's no distance. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't want to rotate. So, and again, I want you to notice that that wanted it to rotate this way. So this is actually positive. And then I could say plus force of Y times, well, zero. So I'm gonna write that in there just so you kind of notice, like you can, you can have a distance of zero. So basically, dude B, this is all my calculations are around that guy right there. By the way, you might you might notice in the back of the book, like like I just typed that in my calculator and I got 21.213 out of you know laziness. I just wrote down 21.2. But when I multiply by 18, if I actually type in 21.2, um, I might be off by a tenth. Does that make sense? So that number 21.2132 is still sitting in my calculator. So even though I wrote down 21.2, I might want to just leave it in my calculator and say times 18. Does it make sense? I'll get a better answer and I even save me time. So I got 331.8 for that. No, 381. 381.8 foot pounds. So that's kind of how badly it wants to rotate toward dude B. Now this, that, this dude over here is of course gonna try to pull back and we want that to be exactly the same. So would you agree I have kind of the same thing? Like this is, and, and here's, a, here's a point about labels. Notice I called this other one the force of Y and now I can only call this one the force of Y and that's not so good because they're both the force of Y. So I could have added like a B over here because that was in the B direction. And this was in the C direction, force of Y at C. And so now all of a sudden we have more subscripts. But notice his force, his vertical force is also pointing straight down. So there isn't gonna be anything as a result of that. But then he has his force of X. I won't relabel that. You can see from the picture what I mean. Would you agree because of this three, four, five triangle that if I took his force, his actual force of 30 pounds or 80 pounds or whatever it is, and what's its horizontal component? It's four fifths of that. Four fifths of his force would actually be in the X direction. Does that make sense to you?
And so for that dude, if I said four fifths of his force times what's its distance? I'm looking right here, perpendicular. Oh, that's only 12 of the feet, right? He's attached lower. So notice he's not getting as much torque because he's not, he doesn't have as long of a lever arm distance. So his, his rope is attached lower, so he's going to have to pull harder. Did you notice that before? Because he's got a lower, no, well, the angle's mixed into it too, but notice at, at least eyeball, their angles are pretty close, but it looks like he's going to have to pull harder. Well, his distance is only 12. And so if I want those to be equal, then I'm going to have to set that equal to 381.8. And so, oh, I just need to divide by 12 and divide by four fifths. Again, the perfect answer to 381.8 is still sitting in my calculator. So I'm just going to leave it there and say divided by 12 and divided by four fifths. Be careful with divided by four fifths. If you type it in like that, divided by four, divided by five, you actually will get this wrong. I wonder if you know why. I have a question. So Go ahead. you have your four fifths times your force, which is your the moment in the x direction, right? Or like it's force in the x direction. Yep. So for the distance, you're timesing the distance of y. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So it's force of x times the distance of y. So I guess I'm that's perpendicular. By timesing by the distance getting force. Um, because his force of x could be. Oh, okay. never mind. It's from the distance from the rotation. Okay. Yeah, it's All the right. distance from where it is and how far it is from the point around which it's rotating. So this question ultimately asked us to find determine the magnitude of force F. So that's why you know I boxed that answer, but I had other important answers along the way. And so notice, true to what we thought conceptually, he did have to pull harder because it was attached lower. Now, we're doing this entirely based on just logic and drawing pictures and seeing the horizontal and vertical, seeing the perpendicular force and the perpendicular distance. We're seeing them and able to draw it. It's just in two dimensions. But remember, we got to do this in three dimensions. And, and uh, this can get complicated. There, there wasn't like six people pulling on this rope, right? It was just a couple. And so, but from the bike example where the, where the forces are not at the correct angle, and that's happening here too. These forces are not perpendicular to the distances in the picture. It's like, I gotta make some calculations to kind of figure that out. Your book calls this the scalar method, which is just you find the forces and the distances, draw pictures, you can see it, you can touch it. That's always appealed to me first, because I was like, I wanna see it and touch it and understand it. As soon as someone tells me, oh, use the cross product. Like it, it took me a number of years as a teacher before I went, I finally understand that. And frankly, this class was one of the reasons because it's kind of like, oh, look, it's a force in Y and it's always a distance in X. And so oh, that's why you're multiplying. That's why you put the numbers in this little boxes and then you multiply them diagonally. I just did it because that's what I was told. That came the right answer came out, but I had no idea what I was talking about. Like that's mostly what happens in math classes. So the scalar method is like takes more time, but you actually can see what's happening. You can observe it, you can touch it, you can see it. But we aren't going to be able to do this, even if we want to, when we go to three dimensions. Maybe you can picture that. Can you picture that this drawing is assuming those two dudes are pulling straight across from each other? But what if one of them like goes around the corner a little bit and all of a sudden they're pulling? Uh oh, now it's like, oh, what's going to happen now? Or what if there wasn't, what if it was 3D? And maybe you can picture that being possible. Thomas is straight across from me and he pulls and I pull, we're all good. But if I go to here and he pulls and I pull, that thing's coming this way. Does it make sense? Now, it might not go toward him or toward me, but we're both pulling it that way, therefore it's going to tip over. So what if Tristan then grabs on and now all three of us are pulling on it? We could actually get it to stay there, but then it'd be really weird, wouldn't it? Because it's like, we've got to get it to not go any direction now. Doesn't it feel more complicated? How is it going to happen now? Three dimensions. Uh, and and so that's where the cross product will be really cool as a technique. But if you don't see the cross product 
here, and again, we haven't even talked about that yet. So well, that's Thursday's discussion. But if you can see, oh, it's one of sports of x times distance in y, then and I'm going to show you a 3D picture, and I'll you you'll, you'll see it, you'll understand it. Um, but it's like that is a really cool trick or device or mnemonic technique. All right, let's look at one more. So this one appeals to me much more than a couple of dorks pulling on a pole because power cranes are freaking awesome. Have you observed them? There's one on, on the hospital right now. We might, we might go, if, if I can see that it's actually working and doing something cool, we should do a little field trip. It only, it only goes at night. I look at it every morning as I go to work. And it's uh, mostly, but if I go full at night, it gets which is crazy. So there, it is actually going at night. Yeah, it was going a lot more back in the day. It's like yeah. it's developed now. I don't know. I just never see it moving as much anymore. But at nighttime, it was going, and we had a lot of patient complaints of it keeping them up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, making a bunch of noises. Yeah. Let me know if you learn anything about that. Um, mm -hmm. I did take last year's engineers class over there, and we, you know, met and had lunch, and at the best food in town is right over there. And then went over and scoped it out, and they. We knocked on the um, whatever he's called, superintendent's trailer or something, and said, "Hey, we're in engineering class," and we got in a little closer. You know, it's like dangerous. But anyway, these things are rad. Um, I'll give you extra credit for this. Go Google search. Um, go Google search like what it takes to put a power crane. Up. How does that work? Like for the most part, you just see one. You're like, "Oh, look, a power crane." But like, what is it? What do they actually have to do? I won't even spoil it for you. What do they have to do? But you can appreciate if this is what's going on here, and you got this big weight right here. Obviously, that's going down, and therefore the whole tower crane. And of course, it wants to rotate around A right here. The whole thing wants to kind of tip over that way. The other thing you can Google search is tower crane failures, and oh man, there's some catastrophic failures. And you should really watch that kind of stuff because that's what you're trying to do as an engineer is avoid that kind of a thing. But you should be able to appreciate just by looking at this picture alone, how in the world, and this is what I actually want you to go search up, how in the world does this not rip out of the ground down here? Do you follow what I'm saying there? Like how could that be attached in such a way that that doesn't tear out? That just doesn't make any sense and like what are you going to bolt them to what's that sitting on there's a ton of force in this and also you might notice that this boom up here is a truss will be that's one of those sections will be studying i think it's chapter four um you know how do those work and how how is the forces transfer through all those little pieces and so it's an amazing thing because you can actually truck all of the pieces and that's part of the thing you'll see on this is you can actually truck the individual sections down the road at night and literally build this ridiculous crane that's 200 feet tall that can just lift all this weight. And it just came on a tiny little truck. I and mean, it's just really sweet. So anyway, I got all these measurements on it, on how far everything is. And then of course I got some info here about weights, but then we got a real problem here. That is a gigantic problem because notice this is not in our system of pounds. That's in metric. And notice that's not grams. What is that? Mega. What's a megagram? This is where you better read chapter one. What's a megagram? I think it's, yeah. So kill, what's a kilogram? That's 10 to the three. Kilogram is 10 to the third. That's a thousand. So that'd be a thousand grams. Mega is yeah, so Mega's next. Six. It's million. It's 10 to the six. So that's 2 million grams. Um, maybe I don't care. Maybe I can just leave it as megagrams. Um, but do you remember this in physics? That's not a force. From chapter one, thanks to our man, my man Newton. I'm going to meet that dude someday. There's a heaven and he makes it there and so do I. <laughs> me and Newton. He probably won't talk to me. Like, dude, don't even, don't even talk to me. <laughs> What's force equal to in terms of Newton from your physics class and from chapter one? Yeah, this is one of the most 
badass equations that exist. So it's a lot of, of math 256 in the summer differential equation is based on that. Because you might remember acceleration is, is a second derivative from your calculus class. And so this is a, that's a, ultimately that's a differential equation. It's an equation with a derivative in it. So unfortunately in the metric system, you're given a mass, but that's not a force. You have to multiply it by gravity. And again, you, you know that, you've seen that before, but, but it's like, that's tricky, right? And again, the simple logic to, to that is, is pounds takes into account, into account that you're measuring your force on earth because you, know, you just don't get to the moon that often. So, but physics, it's like, you know, you could be anywhere. And, and actually your, your, your weight actually changes the further you are away from the earth. But again, we're pretty much standing on the earth. And so, you know, pounds, then we don't have to worry about it, right? <clears throat> so how is force measured in metric? It's a Newton, which is kilogram meter per second squared. Now, based on that force equals mass times acceleration formula, you should say, well, of course, that's the unit for it. Isn't mass measured in grams or kilograms? And then isn't acceleration meters per second squared? So it's a kilogram meter per second squared. Again, somebody thought that's kind of a ridiculous unit. Let's give it a new name. Let's name it after the most badass dude ever. The calculus responsible for all the laws of motion that we know is the reason this as a science even exists, what we're studying right now. So the problem is then, if I'm going to get a force here, does it make sense I got to switch that unit there into kilograms? It's got to be kilograms. So if it had been kilograms, two kilograms, that would have been great. So again, wouldn't it have been nice if they just said the force is 19 Newtons and like we didn't have to do any of this? So if that's the unit, then two, two megagrams is two million grams. And in one kilogram, there is a thousand grams causing the grams to cancel. Two million divided by a thousand is 2,000. Now, maybe you're just good enough to just kind of see that. Oh, I'll just take three zeros off that and then I'll be in kilograms. But you can always let the units do your thinking for you. <clears throat> This is what makes physics hard for people. Like you got to know the language of algebra so you don't have to think. I just needed to convert that. <clears throat> so if I take 2000 kilograms times, what's the acceleration of gravity in this book from chapter one? What do we use in this book? Zero. 9.81 <clears throat> meters per second squared. Probably what you did in physics was 9.8. But again, in this book, we're always extra to three places. So the standard is to carry it out three, de three digits. And so if I take 2,000 times 9.81, notice I haven't even read the problem yet. It's like we haven't got to the crane. We're just like trying to survive one number. Like this is a terrifying question. So I finally just have a force. Like I haven't even multiplied it. I mean, I got forces all over this truss and I haven't done anything yet, but I finally found a force. That's the force and I haven't even read what it is. It's like the tower crane is used to hoist the load. Okay, so now I know that this load up here, and notice I could change that to kilonewtons if I wanted to, 19.62 kilonewtons, but I'm just gonna leave it alone for now. I don't know if that's a good idea. And again, I don't speak I don't speak metric very well, so I'm just like, is that heavy? Like I don't even know. I got to convert it to pounds before I I know. Uh, I vaguely remember. I'm probably mixing this up with other constants in this class, but 55 jumps into my mind, like the divide by 55, and that's the I don't know. I can't remember. So that kind of makes sense. Like, oh yeah, the crane's going to lift that load, and so you can appreciate. 
you can appreciate what's the distance that is if we're trying to figure out how much, and I haven't read the question, but this thing wants to rotate around A. How far is that force from A? Yeah, notice it's perpendicular to this distance. Because remember, you can think of that vector as being, you know, anywhere you want. It's it's here, but it's down here. And isn't that distance right there 12.5? And those are really perpendicular. Like that's perpendicular to A. So and note, what's the unit then going to be because we're in metric? Newtons times meters. Like that's the standard unit for torque or moment. And metric is a newton meter, not a foot pound. So it's foot pounds and ours newton meters here. So anyway, that's how badly that wants to rotate. But remember, the crane has weight. There's a lot of other stuff. The crane could fall down on its own. Like it doesn't even have to lift the weight. That thing is not going to want to stand there on its own. So this problem is kind of cool because it, it doesn't just say, you know, what's happening there. And that's that's the end of it. So it's like, okay, well, let's finally read the question. By the way, what I just did is a great way to do problems. Don't, don't, don't read, don't read it through and go, hmm, that's, that's a lot. I don't really understand. Like, just start figuring stuff out one thing at a time. This is literally how I do questions. I don't even read it. I, I just stare at individual things and I stare at the picture and, and play around with it and try to make sense of things and just trying to understand what's going on. What's with the constant velocity comment? It's hoisting this load at a constant velocity. Actually, it turns out that if you're accelerating it upwards, that's actually causing a moment. If you're lifting it at a constant, then it actually isn't causing any moment. So at first I was just thinking it was just sitting there static and like it's just holding you a little bit. Well, that's a power crane. That isn't designed to hold a load. It's designed to lift it, turn and put it somewhere else, right? So as long as you lift with a constant velocity, then it's actually not creating moment. But can you picture if you accelerate? I mean, does that happen in your car? What happens if you're going down the road and you're set your cruise control at 40 and then you just hammer the accelerator and you have a good car? What happens to your head? Oh, yeah. Rotate. You know what I'm saying? Like it causes a rotation. But are you trying to rotate when you're when you're just uh, cruise control? You don't even know you're moving because relative to the car, you're not moving. Lots of motion. So when you accelerate, that actually causes. So, so they're saying that on purpose, but most of us would just read it and go, what, what are you saying? Okay, so the 1.5 mega Newton jib BD, thank God for BD, because I don't know what a jib is, you should be saying. So 1.5 mega gram, did I say mega Newton? Mega gram jib BD. So here's BD. So that has weight all by itself. That's what I showed you with the beam earlier. In other words, it's not just that 1600 or 19,620 newtons. It's like you've also got the jib that has weight. And notice what's that G? Why did they call it G? G1, G2. Where is that weight? If it's 1.5. I won't calculate it, but I, I did the exact same thing we just did. I took 1500 times 9.81 and I got 14,715 Newtons. But isn't that weight everywhere on that beam? It's not like right there in the middle. And again, the cool thing is, is you can treat that jib like a particle. You can treat it, and, and because it's symmetrical shape, does it make sense that center of mass is center of gravity? That's why they call it G. The center of gravity would be in the middle of it. So in terms of how that thing's going to behave, you can think of all 14,000 newtons there of being in the center. When in reality, it's really... A Newton here, a Newton there, a Newton there, a Newton there is like 14,000 arrows all the way across that thing. Isn't that kind of cool that you can reduce it to a particle in terms of its desire to rotate? Can you appreciate that I would have to take this Newton times one meter and then this one times two meters and then this one times three meters, but it's kind of cool that I can reduce all of that to just one force and knowing it's in the middle means, well, it's in the middle of the distance B, B, D. Isn't that kind of cool? 
So notice I really have 14,715 newtons times the distance of 9.5 meters. So that wanted to rotate all by itself before there was even a load on this. Of course it did. Does that make sense? Like that's that's huge. So that's no joke. That's as much as the weight. That's almost as much as the weight it was lifting. That's how the world works. Let's see what else is going on here. And 0.5 megagram jib BC. Oh, that's this guy over here, BC. So notice G2, and they're telling me that's four meters away. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5, I think that's 500 times 9.81, 4905. So that's a much smaller jib, so it doesn't weigh near as much. That kind of makes sense. So yeah, there's loads everywhere. And maybe you can appreciate that little jib on the back is actually designed to help it not tip over. Notice there's a bunch of junk crammed on the back of it. What do you think that, what do you think that yellow thing is right there? Bunch of weight. It's like I actually, concrete. I actually looked at this on my way to work and I thought that. I was like, oh, it's probably a counteracting force. Mm -hmm. But I think they just put like, whatever they're moving, they use this way. I didn't know, like it looked like almost just like storage. They have these big plates of steel actually, and they can actually lift them up with another crane and put them on there. So they can actually add these plates to it. There's even like a little sub crane sitting on top of that that actually will go down to the ground, pick up a, pick up a plate and bring it up and set it on it. So it's the got a little tiny like, crane. It's like just weighed out specifically for this purpose. Yeah. That's and what so, I imagined, but it didn't look like, I was like, granted it was kind of dark. I was just like, how the heck did they roll that? You can appreciate if this thing was sitting on the ground with a bunch of bolts all the way around it, and then you go up like this, and you got your huge crane sticking out here, and it's got like five, you know, 50,000 pounds on it. It's like that's ripping out of the ground. There's no way. So, what do you do? Well, you got to help it a little bit by, you know, you got a tiny distance back here, but if you put, you know, like 70,000 pounds of steel back there, does it make sense? That helps. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be perfectly balanced. If it was perfectly balanced, you wouldn't even have to have this. You could just set it on the ground and it would just stand there. Yeah, it isn't moving. But of course, your lifting loads changes all the time. And so you can't just like put different plates on there all the time. But if you can get it to where, you know, this these bolts can handle, you know, a thousand pounds, I don't, I don't know, a certain amount, then, then you can kind of do your job. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. Yeah, which they don't on a real power crane, but they show it as having kind of supports that stick out and you can appreciate that would help too. So, wow, we got forces everywhere. Notice we're up to three forces. Um, <clears throat> centers of mass G1, G2, determine the required mass of the counterweight C. So I'm gonna call that force of C. So they didn't tell me what that was. I thought they were going to. I thought they were gonna tell me that way. That was some weight they put on there. So that the resultant moment produced by the load and the weight of the tower crane jibs is nothing. So there's four forces. Do you agree with that? That's what they told me. With respect to rotation, that is true. There's four forces, but how come they didn't put, how come they didn't tell me what this weighed? Doesn't it have a bunch of weight too? I mean, after all, didn't this weigh 14,000 newtons? And isn't that power like made of the same stuff? That's, that's just going to be the overall force. It's not going to rotate at all. So. It's not causing rotation because it's aiming straight at A. So that weight, even if it was like a billion newtons, is not getting it to rotate. Now, if it was a billion newtons, it'd probably sink into the dirt. That'd be a problem. But what we're talking about is just is this thing going to tip over? That's why there's two things to think about. Is it moving? Ultimately, this class will be what we call equilibrium. Is it moving? You can't have it moving left and right, up and down in X, Y, Z. You can't move, but it also can't rotate. Right now, we're just worried about rotation. So those are all the forces causing rotation. And so they, it's all there. They got it. Awesome. OK, so let me show you. We're almost in. Um, remember. Rotating in this direction is negative. Rotating in this direction is positive. And I got stuff working against each other here. So I got to be really careful with this. I can't just add them all up. You see what I'm saying? 
And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this in, in kind of an easier way for myself, rather than thinking of like the ones on the left or fighting with the ones on the right, I'm just gonna add them all up and set them equal to zero, but just be careful to notice the ones that wanna go this way are negative and the ones that go this way are positive. You see what I'm saying? So you could think of it as a fight between the stuff on the right and the stuff on the left, that'd be fine too. But I'm just gonna do it using that. So let's see, negatively, I've got negative 19, 6, 20. And notice I've already taken care of the units, so I'm gonna leave them off here. That's Newtons times a distance of 12.5 meters, and that's negative. But then I've also got another negative, 14, 7, 15, times its distance of 9.5 meters. Then on the other side, I've got 495, but it's actually trying to get it to go positively, isn't it? 4905, and its distance is four meters. And then finally, I've got the force of C, which I don't know, times a distance of 7.5 meters. And I need all of that to add up to nothing because I don't want it to rotate, right? How much rotation? I want none. So does it make sense this is the calculation you're making if you're putting plates on the back of this thing? So if you drive by the one at the hospital and we don't get a chance to go over there, like look at it, there's individual plates, you can see them. So they're, I don't know if they actually adjust them during the construction process. Um, because, you know, early on they're lifting rebar and that's really heavy and then they take some off because now they're lifting lighter things. I don't know if they can kind of do the whole project with uh, with just setting it up and then they have to touch that again. I actually don't know. I'd be willing to bet, too, there's some kind of alarm system. You're the dude up there lifting it. And if it, if it tilts more than, say, five degrees, it's probably like alarms go off and it might even take the controls out of your hands and just like set the load down because obviously it falling would not really be good for anybody. Okay, well, that's pretty easy. I'll punch this in and I'm done. Um, algebraically, does it make sense that I'm gonna take, take all of this and sort of move it to the other side of the equal sign? So I'm gonna take that negative 19,620, I'm gonna make it positive. So I'm gonna type 19,620, parenthesis 12.5, plus 14,715 parenthesis 9.5, but then this plus 4905 is going to become minus, so minus 4905 times 4, so I got force of C times 7.5 equals, holy cow, 235802, 9700, I'm going to divide that by 7.5, I got that many newtons. Let's see if I have a copy of the answer to this from some previous class so that I can just make sure I didn't do something stupid. Um, let's see, what was it asking for the, required mass, did I get the required mass? No, I got the required force. So this is not what would be in the back of the book, because that's a force, not a mass, right? Now, secondly, what would be in the back of the book? Remember how we can't have numbers that, that big? So just to make sure you're able to read the back of the book. It's always like multiples of three. So if I move the decimal to there, that becomes kilonewtons, right? If I moved it to there, it becomes meganewtons. So it'd be 314 meganewtons. That's what I see in the back of the book for this. Just out of curiosity. But again, the question actually asked for the mass. And actually, that's a little bit practical because that's based on gravity. So didn't we say force is equal to mass times acceleration? So if my force is, 
I'm going to write force of C because I don't want to write that stupid number again. Equals mass times 9.81. Oh, I got to divide that by 9.81. That makes sense. And then I would have a mass. So the number still in my calculator. I divide by 9.81. And I get, let's see, what am I getting? Am I getting grams? What am I getting for a unit here? I'm getting kilograms. That's exactly right. Because a, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So I got 32049333 and even some decimals after that, kilograms. Yeah, I'm worried something's wrong here. Oh, huh. yeah. I would. I won't take the time to show you. Yes, I will. No, I won't. Um, your graphing calculator is really important um, because you can actually see everything you type. So one of those parentheses that I I put right here, I actually left that parenthesis off right there, and therefore it screwed up the whole order of operations, which means my answer is totally wrong. Yeah. So. Forty-eight seven twenty-three. Yeah. yeah, that's what I got too. So let me just go super quick, fix that. But, and as I often say in my classes, I'm I'm really glad that happened because you know does that. Because I got that wrong, does that mean I don't understand what I'm doing? No, it's just kind of something stupid. But the question is, am I going to be able to determine that from your work? <laughs> am I going to be able to see that? But you kind of knew it too. I feel like you're, that's what you're like, oh, I got it wrong because it should be in pounds or it should be in kilograms. And then you thought that might fix it. Exactly. You were at, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then I look at my answer and it should have been like 4,900 kilograms and I still got like 3 billion kilograms yeah. or whatever. So if I take that number divided by 9.81, I got 4.9.6. Well, 6.7. Again, as I've told you before, if you put that on your test, good job, you're done. But is that what you're going to see in the back of the book? No, because it took four numbers to write that down. So if I move this three places over, then I just added another thousand to the unit of that. So it went from kilo to mega. So it's 4.97. Isn't that way? Three numbers, right? This is what you'd see in the back of the book. I don't care. Either one of those is fine as far as I'm concerned. But one of the reasons I love this question is like people die if you get that calculation wrong. And because you left out a parenthesis, does that mean people didn't die? <laughs> uh -uh. That's why I love BC Calc. Like I wasn't kidding when I said that. And I didn't make that mistake on accident. I was just like really fast. But it's like you got to double check this stuff. So when I when I send out stuff that I do because I don't have an engineering stamp, I have to send the stuff out. I showed you that the other day, but it's like they actually have they do the calculations and their, their piece of paper that they work on. They actually hand it to some other dude in the engineering and they remake the calculation. And so they have their name at the top and then checked by at the bottom. And so there's like two people that have looked at it because you can't afford to make mistakes on stuff like this. So between people checking each other's work and software to keep this kind of thing from happening. But of course, what I think would be fun is, you know, that literally is a crane that's like 300 feet tall or whatever. It'd be extremely cool to put that weight on it and then like, stand back and see if it stood there like that's whoa that would be really intense wouldn't it like if wouldn't you find yourself checking this a lot more times <laughs> and and do you also agree that this is massively oversimplified because we aren't weighing ropes there's no wind is it wind going to cause a moment on that and wind comes and goes wind's like a live load on this and well, we're not measuring as far as we go so we're not going to go back and forth 
Exactly. Yeah. So, so measure from the end if you want the mass flow of it. I'm actually, to be honest with you, I'm a little bit surprised that that weight on the back isn't on some kind of a motor system. So that when you extend the load further on this side, making it want to fit this way, that the, the motor just moves that weight further out on the other oh, side and kind of balance. So, so it's that has to have been invented. And you know why? And it wouldn't even have to be calculations being made. It could just be if the, the power part of it, whatever that's called, the power part of it, start if it senses it's being tipped, you know, which wouldn't be hard to regulate, but it just kind of like a conveyor belt. So it's back to even again. Like you wouldn't even have to make it. It's interesting to me. You should make us all sign NDAs that hasn't been mm -hmm. invented yet. I know exactly that. You're gonna go get totally shit. Send me a Christmas card, aren't you? <laughs> all right. This will be pretty typical. I'm gonna to try to get out of here by 12:30 every day. This is still 10, 10 minutes away, but it's more likely gonna be. But if you have something going on, you need to leave. Don't. I just feel like you can't. Okay, so.